So our next uh, presenter is remote, um, and I heard him on earlier, so I'm, I'm assuming that's all set up, and it will be John Wixwell. So John is at uh, Vanderbilt University. He's also been a, an active um, participant, um, contributor to the NCATS Tissue Chip Project, which is where I've gotten to know uh, John. And he's going to uh, continue to build on the complexity in these microphysiological systems by talking about uh, functional coupling in addition to some other enabling kinds of uh, technologies. So with that, turning it Thanks, over to you. Can you hear me? We can, John. OK, great. Uh, Brian, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I apologize I couldn't come today. I'm going to be building on what Megan said and describe functional coupling of different organs. Next slide. Next slide, please. Ah, so there's a disclosure. I'm funded by lots of people. Um, I've been funded by lots of people. I have no conflict of interest, and my comments do not uh, are not in, endorsed by EPA. Next slide. That's a mandatory statement from EPA. So today's talk is going to focus on some questions regarding microphysiological systems. Next slide. And the first one is, what are the problems that I'm trying to address? Next slide. So basically, molecules are small and fast, and animals are large and slow. So much of the complexity of biology comes from the fact that we're spanning so much space and time. Next slide. But the complexity is also that effects at the molecular level can affect the animal, and effects at the animal can affect both the molecule and the gene. So I tend to view homeostasis as an orbit in a 10 to the fourth or a million dimension phase space. Aging and disease are trajectories in that orbit. From the point of view of um, this, this meeting is that the drugs can act at any of the scales and that animals are not perfect models of humans. Next slide. So my career goal right now is to try to introduce two new species, Homo chipians, which is a nanohuman, and Homo minutus, which is a microhuman, and then do organ on a chip talk safety. And when you couple the organs together, you create a homunculus. And so in the middle, you see the human holding a micro, a, a millihuman holding a microhuman holding a nanohuman. Next slide. So one of the other things that I've been focusing on for a good number of years is the problem of cell volume. I call it the volume problem. In conventional cell media, cell culture, you have a 10 micron layer of cells. And the general rule is that a cell has a volume of a picoliter. It requires a nanoliter of media a day. And hence, you accomplish this in conventional cell culture by putting a centimeter of media above your 10 micron cells, change the media once a day. But your signaling factors are diluted a thousand fold because of that. In microfluidic tissue culture, instead you bring the lid down and you still have the picoliter nanoliter relationship that says you change fluid 5,000 times a day, which is more than you ask for a graduate student or a technician. And the bottom line is if you do this right, you can have very low dilutions of paraffin and other factors. Next slide, please. OK, so where are we today in the whole business of, of drug toxicity testing? Next slide. OK, today, 2D biology on plastic, Megan listed some of the problems. I have a somewhat more cynical view about the cells that are growing in our plastic. I'll let you read that. The bottom line is that even though you have cancerous inbred diabetic cells, you can get reproducible statistically significant results. If instead you go to animals, subject of, of this conference, they are not people and they have genetic and physiological differences in addition to the ethical <coughs> concern. And finally, toxicity tests in people are not wise, particularly if, if you didn't intend to conduct it. Next slide. So let's do a, a slight overview of microphysiological systems. Next slide. So this is the Long on a chip that Dan Hu and Don Engber published in Science in 2010. It's credited as having launched the DOD and NIH interest in organs on a chip. And it was basically an air fluid interface with epithelial cells on one side 
endothelial on the other, supported by a PDMS membrane with holes. The side chambers allowed you to stretch that to replicate breathing in an alveolar membrane, and they had beautiful demonstrations that they could recapitulate physiology that was not evident in biology on flat plastic. Next slide. Okay, the V says spun off um, emulate, and they have a variety of different organ shifts. Next slide. Synvivo uh, has been looking at <coughs> drug transport through vascular networks and expanded their technology to include a um, brain on a chip in the upper right and a liver on a chip on the lower right. In both of these models, you are looking at a cross section. It's a, a planar cross section in, in the uppercase against the blood-brain barrier, so you can see cells cross the barrier. Next slide. Uh, Nordis, a spinoff from the University of Washington, has a technique for making very small uh, tubular pores through a collagen matrix. So you can feed your cells in the matrix. You can also see the inside of, of the pore. And the middle picture shows a tissue-engineered microvessel, and they're figuring out how to um, parallelize these things to live in an incubator. It's a very cute platform. Next slide. So we're working at Vanderbilt on mammary gland on a chip where each of the red dots, the four red dots in the middle is a microbioreactor, termed a thick tissue bioreactor to support a uh, mammosphere. Lower left, we have brain on a chip. The, the blue is the brain compartment and the red Underneath is the vascular compartment, the barrier in between. Next to it is the perfusion controller. Upper right, we have T cells on a lymph node in a chip. And lower right, we have part on a chip where we can take human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, grow a construct, compute the um, mechanical response to stimulus, and then get Frank Starling curve and, more importantly, quantify things in terms of the Hill model. Next slide. Okay, so what you see on these organs on a chip, there are a variety of different flavors, um, generally either 2D, two, two plus dimensions, um, or 3D architectures. And I think everyone is trying to get these technologies out to pharma, environmental toxicology, and basic scientists. Next slide. Now, it's extremely important to study organoids in this context. So organoids are self-assembling systems that um, you take some number of cells, allow them to undergo differentiation and self-assembly. We cannot ignore organoids. We'll talk more about them in a moment. Next slide. So if, if we go through the organoid, they do much better in complex biology than, than 2D biology. They are self-organizing. One of the limitations, there's several limitations, you can't do barrier studies easily, um, and it's hard to replicate because your, each organoid might come out looking different from another organoid. Next slide. Now we can go to organ chips. The general view is that organ chips are better than 2D biology. They're ideal for barrier function. They can give you thick extracellular matrix. As we'll see in a minute, they can support organ-organ interaction. Um, we're choosing to make organs that are uh, large enough to do multiomics, mass spectrometry in particular, a metabolomic, metabolic measurement. Um, this addresses the volume problem. You could build an animal on a chip. There are significant disadvantages. They are currently low throughput, though Megan is, is make the technology that Megan is using can be made high throughput. Uh, they're not fully validated. Later this morning, Jim Stevens is going to talk about weighted gene co-expression network analysis. This needs to be done on organs on ship. It hasn't been done yet. Um, human cells are expensive, so um, Paul Burridge points out that that's getting easier. And you can't transplant an organ on a chip into a person that you might do with an organoid. Next slide. OK, the key to decision that I made a couple of years ago was based on a comment that Matt Wagner made, which is that he is lumping <coughs> organs on chips, tissue chips, 3D trans wells, and self-assembling organoids into the, the term microphysiological system. And I think if you don't <coughs> do that, you're going to end up eliminating something by accident. 
So I'm basically indicating organoids are microphysiological systems as are planar and 3D devices. Next slide. Okay, so what do you do with these things? Here we have a homunculus with a heart that has uh, electrical activity. This could be um, one of the hearts that Megan built. You have a breathing lung, you have a liver, you have a stomach. Could you please click the mouse? So you basically in ingest uh, a drug, it goes into the stomach, it dissolves, it goes to the liver, it's metabolized, it goes from the liver through the lung into the heart, suddenly causes a cardiotoxicity, and luckily no human dies. Click. So we're basically building these homunculi because biology is complex and the homunculi can simplify things. And in theory, the construction is very simple. You take human cells and uh, make an organ, connect the organs, and you can do lots of things at one time. Next slide. I think everyone here has seen that slide, but what I've added is the location of where you um, put organs on chips. Early, you would put single nanohumans in the preclinical stage. Later, you might do multiple microhuman organs on a chip. I think most importantly is if you're in the phase one stage with a family of drugs and you see that something strange is happening, you could then take that family of drugs back for a high content analysis in essentially revisiting the preclinical stage. Um, again, the idea is I think everyone at this meeting understands where animals fit into this picture and organs on a chip fit in a couple of different ways. Next slide, please. Okay, the FDA has a vision which basically says clinical trials in a dish from early drug discovery to regulatory safety assessment replace animals. They do point out that some of the potential applications are further from reality while others are relatively close to implementation. Okay, next slide. Now, Dave Watson had an even more interesting image. Imagine the human on a chip using cells from patients who are in the hospital today. I'll let you read this, but the bottom line is that you can do all sorts of things, ideally on the personalized medicine approach, and it was reassuring to hear Paul Burridge explain how quickly and economically they can produce an IPSC line from hundreds of patients a year. So I think this is probably an extremely important way to take um, both personalized medicine and organs on chip. Next slide. So you have to keep these systems alive. Next slide. Basically, if you have an organ, you have an arterial reservoir, you have a venous reservoir, and you flow through the organ in the brain on a chip where you have actually um, stromal tissue and vascular side, you have to have two per parallel perfusion systems, one for extracellular fluid uh, and the other through the vessel. Next slide. I think a lot of people, our group included, are using syringe pumps in an incubator. Um, they have the disadvantage of being large footprint, expensive, and most importantly, um, it's hard to do continuous perfusion, and it's very hard to recirculate in, in a smooth fashion. Next slide. So, um, Luke Lee's group at Berkeley spun off a company called Cell ASIC that was using pressurized reservoirs to drive the fluid through the, um, um, the, the chip. Nordis uh, liked that idea and created the, the platform that I showed before. It has a number of advantages. Um, it's low cost. First, it actually is the first to market on this kind of thing. It can be readily emulated. It has the disadvantage of it's hard to recirculate and it's hard to run um, two or more interconnected organs and they don't have valves to do logic operations on the process. Next slide. So we worked on inventing a small, um, a very small microfluidic pump that in the middle picture, it basically worked as if you were driving a, uh, an orange between the palms of your hands. And in the bottom, you see they come in large, medium, small, and very small sizes and are driven by Arduinos that are, are soon to be replaced by um, dedicated microprocessors. Next slide. But, Lisa McCauley and Dmitry Markov in their mammosphere bioreactors initially started with uh, a pressure feed, noticed that there were some inconsistencies in flow rate and balancing, but they came up with a very clear doxotoxal uh, dose response curve with their mammospheres and are now moving towards using these small pumps. And in upper right, you basically have a 
um, the four central chambers are the multi-well um, tissue bioreactor. Next slide. I think the most significant advance we had was when Frank Block invented a normally closed rotary planar valve, which is a very simple microfluidic device that lets us switch any number of, of channels, up to, right now up to 24. Um, then you, once you have the valve capability, you can start designing perfusion controllers that mix pumps and valves for logical operations like drug delivery and sample removal. Next slide. So I, I drew this slide um, a number of years ago to show that if you have pumps and valves, you can in fact come up with devices that we call perfusion controllers for control of organs and organ interaction. Next slide. So our concept at Weber is to basically create general purpose components. An organ is an individual <coughs> module. You couple the modules together. Um, you do system sensing, closed loop control. Most importantly, we are talking about a, a gadget called a missing organ microformulator to provide the secreted compounds that whatever organ you chose not to include but was asked for by the referees can be faked. Um, and then you can do lots of untargeted inline near real time analytics. Next slide. Okay, so how do you couple them together? Next slide. Um, Mike Schuler and Jay Hickman have done a whole lot of work on uh, rocker systems where you connect multiple organs. The beauty of their analysis is they are working very hard to understand PKPD and coupled organ systems. Next slide. Uh, Tissues in Germany is coming up with pressure um, pneumatically driven pumps to couple two organs, four organs, and they have a 10 organ chip coming online. Again, small volumes, and this is basically a auto feeding well plate. Next slide. The volume problem remains, and it turns out that if you go to microfluidics, you still have to be careful about the, in panel D in the bottom, you have to be careful about the volume in the media on both sides. Ultimately, I believe that organs on a chip are going to be everything on a chip with a pump, either on a chip or connected by, by short lengths of tubing. Next slide. Okay, so under five years of support from NIH NCAT, Vanderbilt Hopkins, Baylor, Pittsburgh, Washington, and Duke, put together a um, concept of a um, microhuman where we have the different organs talking to each other. Next slide. And what we did for our first demonstration was basically move fluid from one reservoir to the other, and we actually did it by FedEx across state lines. So this is a federally regulated um, process. Next slide. Now, the, the beauty of that is that Larry Vernetti at Pittsburgh, who put the work together, has the workflow that shows how all of this worked. It was published earlier this year. Next slide shows the kinds of things that we learned. We studied vitamin D transport, terfenidine transport, and TMA transport. Most importantly, TMA, which is a metabolite generated by intestinal microbiome, um, produces a meta secondary metabolite called TMAO, and at the time we published this, TMA penetration of the blood-brain barrier was not known in the literature, but we showed that it crossed, and Jackie Brown, who did the work with that, uh, told me yesterday she just found a paper where that finding in, um, in our chip is actually confirmed now by clinical studies. Next slide. Okay, do we need recirculation? Next slide. The idea of recirculation is you have a pump, you have to have bubble to treat bubble and a de debris trap, you have the organ on a chip, next slide. You can start playing games with uh, recirculation. I think you're going to need it. Animals recirculate, biology in, in the lab needs to recirculate. Next slide. Uh, we've come up with um, topologies that allow us to adjust the volume being recirculated and most importantly the media replacement rate and the microclinical analyzer is an electrochemical sensor to, to test for glucose depletion and lactate buildup. Next slide. You can then go with, with more complicated valves, and this is a work in progress to couple multiple organs. Uh, next slide. Okay, what can you measure from these models? Megan gave a good list. We have a few more to add. Obviously, cellular morphology, we're doing tier. Whoops, 
You went too fast on that. Okay, forward. Okay. Uh, protein production would be ELISA, transcriptomics, drug metabolism, untargeted metabolomics. The key thing is that the sensitivity of the assays is set by the ratio of cell volume to media volume. So we're back to the volume problem. Next slide. This will go quickly. We have the brain on a chip with the, uh, the mammary gland, with the system and the data we acquire. Um, Endpoint evaluations can be everything from elastomechanics to um, quantities measured with the um, brain on a chip, metabolic activity, uh, and most importantly, at the bottom, proteomics and metabolomics. Next slide. There's a workflow we can just skip past, but the idea is you can take NVU effluent, run it through a mass spectrometry, develop a metabolic network, and identify the active pathways. This has just been published. Next slide. Um, we're gearing up to do neuroelectric recordings, where you can, in fact, record from each of the neurons that you're growing in the brain on a chip. Next slide. Then you have to worry about control. Next slide. We had the microformulator, which we talked about before. Matt Wagner saw it and said, hey, I want 96 of them. So we built a device in the upper right called the Beast. And there at AstraZeneca, Matt's left, but AstraZeneca is continuing to look at adjustment of PK profile, not through chemistry, but through fluidic control. And the other pictures are gadgets that we have either delivered or are delivering to AstraZeneca. Next slide. Um, drug dosing and drug response are circadian. You don't want to take acetaminophen in the morning after a hangover because of, of diurnal susceptibility. Next slide. So some of my students started working on what is, in fact, hormonal modulation of organs on chips. So in vivo, you have, in the case of the liver, um, three endocrine organs that have circadian modulation of the liver. Next slide. We have in press right now a hormonal modulation map, a circadian modulation map of the seven organs in the, in the system we showed, coupled system we showed before. Next slide. And you can see that there's significant hormonal variations in each of these organs, and they're all quite different. And this can now be replicated in vitro. Next slide. Okay, upstream endocrine organs on the left is biology, the right is what we can do, and on the bottom is the gadget we're building to do this modulation. Next slide. There are technical challenges. I think you know them all. You may know many of them. They were published in 2013. Next slide. In a paper that's coming out uh, this month, um, Dave Watson of, of Eli Lilly, Rosemary Hunziker of NIH and I, look at this and decide that disease biology pharmacology is the greatest payoff for microphysiological systems. ADME, PK, ClinFarm is next. And we put toxicology at third because of the great strength of existing toxicology and inertia in the field. But it's important, but not the, the mover that I think some people thought it might be. Next slide. Okay, there are things you can do with microphysiological systems that you can't do with other, with other models, including get both sides of the barriers, mechanically active systems like Megan talked about, complex uh, heterogeneous cultures, and most importantly, organ-organ interaction. Next slide. And there are some problems that are at the cutting edge or beyond. I think it's going to be difficult to recreate the full metastatic cascade, although some of the latter steps are, are clearly accessible to MPS. And immuno-oncology, you have to worry about building an MHC HLA compatible homunculus. Next slide. And these are the numerous people I've worked with. Thank you very much. Thanks, John.